From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Project podcast. This one is episode 201. I am Brad Robinson. Today, I have a very powerful Q&A episode. You guys from the recovery community, you always send me great stuff, great questions. Today, I'm talking about habits. When you are in that anxious loop, Your mind is all over the place. You don't know where to start when it comes to your rituals and routines that you need to implement. What do you implement? Where do you start from? So I'm talking about that, the beginning steps to that new lifestyle you deep down, you want to manifest, right? I'm also talking about foods to avoid that will help mental clarity to reduce anxiety. I'm talking about that appointment you have, that dentist appointment, the doctor's appointment, where you feel anxious and you're afraid, you know, what if I faint? What if I have that panic attack? What if I embarrass myself in front of the doctors or dentists, right? So there's that fear revolving around that experience. How do you mentally prepare yourself? How do you mentally train yourself before the experience so that the experience is way less terrifying, really powerful. And then I'm talking about how you can assert yourself more, how someone like my old self who was agreeable, who was shy, how I became more of an assertive person. That is really important to know as well. So stick around because I have a lot to talk about today. Before we dive in, though, I do want to give you guys a brief update on what's happening behind the scenes of my life, because I don't really talk about that that much. I talk about my old experiences with anxiety, but what are the things now that I'm currently improving upon outside of the podcast or the YouTube channel or the coaching? And so the first thing is that I am slowly increasing the amount of time I spend at the gym. The gym has always been a really, it's been a a real battle for me to get myself to go pretty much all the time. And so what I've been doing is I've been setting goals during the week of when I'm going to go how long I'm going for, and then slowly building upon that time. You know, instead of for staying for 30 minutes, I'm going to stay for 31 minutes, right? And I'm just building up that time. So I used to, right when the pandemic was ending and things were opening up, so getting back into the gym was difficult. But what I started to do was I was like, I'm going to go one day a week for half an hour And that's my goal for the week, just to get in, get back into it, right? I don't want to set the bar too high or I'm just not going to do it. So I went, started to go one day a week for half an hour. Then it eventually got to two days a week for half an hour each. And then it went to three days a week for half an hour each. And now it's getting up to three days a week for 45 minutes each time. So that's been really beneficial and it's gradual, right? Like I'm the guy who needs to do things like that. Like I need to uh, slowly implement the 1% changes instead of just going all in and just bam, here we go. Because very few people can really go all in and and remain in that uh, consistent pattern, right? Because that's that's a lot of weight to put on yourself. So I like to gradually increase it over time. And that's what works best for me. Other than that, I've been on the carnivore diet for quite a bit of time. So I mostly eat meat, pretty much. That's what the carnivore diet is, is meat, eggs, fish, some poultry, 
uh, some pork, but a lot of fatty red meat. And this is something that I didn't just jump into, right? Like I was saying, I gradually went from a ketogenic diet with vegetables and meat, eggs, and some dark chocolate and nuts. And then I started to reduce like the nuts. I started to reduce the chocolate and I started to feel better over time. And I've been experimenting with diet for the last four years. And the best that I've felt are at times when I've only eaten meat and eggs and uh, bacon. You, You understand. So that's where I am at with diet. I will touch upon diet a little bit here in today's Q&A. Also, I've been reading more audiobooks. You know, sometimes, usually, I am unable to find that time to sit down with a book because uh, I have a busy schedule. So what I'll do is I'll put in an audiobook. And I found some great free audiobooks on YouTube at my local library that Well, that uh, have been unbelievably helpful. Recently, I read this book called Essentialism, which is so powerful. And I recommend the book, Essentialism. I can't remember the author at this moment, but uh, you can Google it and I'm sure you'll find the author. Really powerful book. It talks about how... Minimalism enhances the quality of your life. What is essential and grabbing onto that, those essential things, aspects of your life and dispensing the rest that's just garbage, that's just not useful for you, that's just clutter in your house. And uh, so that's just a small update of what's been happening. Now... Let's dive in to today's Q&A. And the first question comes from Luke. He says, my mind is all over the place. I don't know where to start with habits that will calm down my system. Where do I start? What do you do to slow down? Luke, great question. Thank you for that. First of all, the anxious mind consists of too much disorder. There's just too much clutter. So imagine a room or even a house that is filled with things. It's a mess. Decades of hoarding. If the person does not let go of the things they do not need, then all of that space in the house gets occupied with these things. Then when you are looking for something that you need, it's unbelievably stressful. It's aggravating. So the question becomes, where do you start? The task of cleaning the house is now too overwhelming, which makes people not do it. The dragon is too big. There's too much, too many snakes to confront, which means it shrinks the possibility of you successfully completing the task. So find one manageable snake. You find one corner of one room that you can organize and get right. You have to start with the small snake. This immediately reduces the stress level because the snakes have reduced in numbers. So you're saying to yourself, hey, this is manageable. I am capable of more than I thought, right? The thing that was too overwhelming, well, doesn't seem so overwhelming the more you tackle the small snakes because one snake leads into another, which leads into another. So Luke Introduce one habit into your life. Find one that works for the people, for your mentors you admire. And make space for that. Make space. So if 
for example, if I'm somebody you relate to, if you're saying, hey, Brad, you know, Brad went through the same thing I'm currently battling. How did he get out of it? What did he do? And if I say, well, this is my routine, which I will talk about, trust in what I say and implement it. Because in the end, what do you know? If you're in a place, if you're in a place that is overwhelming, that's painful, that's not serving you the way you want it to serve you, everything is against you, you're overly stressed, you're overly anxious, life is chaotic, then trust that this habit Brad implements will be of some benefit to me. And so then, this is what I did, Luke. I found one of those mentors and I just trusted that these habits are useful because this person used to suffer from anxiety and they do not anymore. Okay, so I'm just going to trust that this is something that will serve my higher self. And you have to sit down with yourself and ask, why am I doing it? Write this down. Write it down. How will my life be like three months from now if I stick with this? If my current habits of the day if they are not producing the results I'm looking for, if by the end of the day, when I put my head on my pillow, if I'm exhausted, stressed out, overwhelmed, why not do the opposite of what I've been doing? Why not? And the reason is a lot of people don't do it is because painful experiences become their new normal. Pain and suffering becomes their normal. So when you introduce a habit, say, I'm going to meditate for 10 minutes in the morning before I go to work. You introduce that habit. Then the body goes, hey, this is what Brad is not familiar with. Brad is familiar with chaos, running around, uh, eating whatever's in the fridge, uh, you know, smoking weed to cope, talking to loved ones to cope. But you introduce this habit, the body goes, I'm not familiar with this. Maybe this is not right for me. But you have to give it at least two months for the habit to become ingrained. And then I want you to ask yourself, why would I keep listening to that inner undisciplined, underdeveloped voice? Why would I still listen to that voice if... If it's been keeping me in that suffering. So be honest. Then I want you to examine what what parts of your day do you feel most chaotic. Now if you have a job that causes you a lot of anxiety. It's very stressful. You can add more space around your job. So outside of the job and inside the job. That will help make everything more manageable. Because remember, the anxiety sufferer has a glass overflowing with water. And so each drop of water, each unknown experience that pops up into their day makes the water overflow even more. So how can you reduce the water? Part of that is to add more space in your day to do habits that activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest system. Meditation, walks in nature, you know, avoiding Netflix and then introducing some time. Maybe you're reading a book. Maybe you're listening to something informative. Maybe you're listening to this podcast and just having a cup of tea. The body loves routine. Your body wants to be automated as much as possible. And 
if you have too much uncertainty in your day to day, you have to add certainty. You have to add structure to your day. So for me, my structure includes a morning and night routine. So when I wake up in the morning at the same time every day, I'll make my bed, I'll go into another room, I'll sit down, I'll write in a journal, which is structured for 10 minutes. And then after the journal, what I will do is meditate for half an hour. And then after the meditation, I'll get down on a yoga mat, I'll stretch for 10 minutes, and then I'll go and take a cold shower. That's my routine. My routine now is different from than it was four years ago. It evolved into what it is now because I found what works best for me. But to start off, just keep it simple and keep it light. So you wake up, maybe you make your bed, you go into a room, you write in a journal for five minutes, then you meditate for 10 minutes, and maybe that's your routine starting off. But what makes this so powerful is that the routine adds certainty. You know what when you wake up, what you're going to do. But the routine also calms down the body. So if you have a lot of stuff circling in the mind, the journal is great to get that onto paper. Also, when you write in your journal what you're excited about today, it activates your curiosity. It activates your excitement. You start to look forward to the day. You start to perceive the challenges as opportunities. And you start to change the meaning behind certain situations. You develop a momentum in the morning. And then after you write down what you're excited about, you write down what you're grateful for. So you're shifting all of your mental energy from catastrophic thoughts, the what if thinking, down to positive thoughts. What am I grateful for? And then after that, you write down anything that's uh, on your mind onto the journal. And then, you know, you go, go and sit and you meditate. The next question comes from Gloria. How can I prepare myself for an upcoming doctor's appointment? I had a terrible experience with needles, so did I, Gloria, where I felt like I was going to pass out. I've been avoiding appointments ever since until I came across your podcast. Now I must confront what I fear the most. Thank you for everything. Gloria, well, first of all, I am so glad you decided to confront the dragon. I mean, this is no easy thing. I had a strong fear of needles. I have, I've had bad experiences with needles. I I have an episode, which I will leave a link below about my needle experiences that goes over a certain doctor's appointment in more detail where I did faint from having a needle and how I managed to build up on that bravery and confront that experience again. Now, the first thing I want to recommend is you write down all of your fears revolving around this doctor's appointment. So you want to release all of these emotions onto paper because this shrinks them in size. And you'll notice the difference after you write them out. And then I want you to imagine how you want the experience to go the way you want it to go. This adds certainty to the unknown. This is mental preparation. This is mental training. The unconscious mind best understands images and emotions. So play out this mental movie before the doctor's appointment. This is so powerful. I'll repeat that part again. The unconscious mind best understands images and emotions. So you sit with yourself. Imagine the day. Imagine yourself driving to the appointment, looking confident. You're breathing very deeply. You're looking relaxed. You show up there. You shake the secretary's hand. 
and you are sitting in the waiting room, you're looking confident, and you walk into the doctor's looking confident, you shake the doctor's hand, and you imagine yourself getting the blood drawn, no matter how un- uncomfortable it may feel to you. Then I want you to notice the self-talk you're feeding yourself while you're getting your blood drawn. Then I want you to imagine yourself leaving the doctor's office, looking confident, happy that you accomplished this dragon. You may even strike a superwoman pose or a superman pose. And then you go do something that you really enjoy to reward yourself for tackling something very, very, very difficult. So I want you to do that before the appointment. And then I want you to anticipate that the amygdala will activate while you're in the doctors because it knows you have had a painful experience here before. But by staying in that situation that is making you uncomfortable, you are creating new associations between the environment and the dread. That this situation is not going to kill you because that's how the amygdala is reacting to the situation. You shouldn't be here because this is going to devour you. But you stay and you are making new associations when you stay. By going through the experience, Gloria, you are making yourself braver, okay? Then, when you're feeling anxious, you use rational self-talk to calm down the amygdala because we can. We can use our more developed brain to talk to our more ancient brain. So, if you say things like, if it kills me, let it kill me. Come on, bring it on. This is an opportunity for me to change. So what if I faint? At least I'm facing my fears. So what if I embarrass myself? This is my dragon to conquer. This is my dragon. Saying these things and making them short is really powerful. The amygdala starts to calm down. Right? It feels like the amygdala is like this screaming inner child that's whining. And I feel when I am in those situations... I have to really spout those short utterances to myself. If it kills me, let it kill me. If it kills me, let it kill me. So what if I faint? So what? That's a great question. Also, I recommend you watch my video on panic attacks, the step-by-step guide to overcoming panic. I use the acronym STAY, S-T-A-Y. I'll leave the link below. In this video, I talk about the S, which means SPOT. Notice that this situation is making you uncomfortable, anxious. Then the T stands for THINK, using short utterances to calm down your anxiety response. So what? If it kills me, let it kill me. And then I want you to breathe in. That's the A, air. Breathe in for two and then exhale for two. Notice your oxygen coming in and out as you are thinking these rational thoughts. Breathe in for two and then breathe out for three. And then breathe in for three and then breathe out for four. Counting is a really great way to calm down the amygdala. The next thing is why. Yield. Wait until the anxiety lessens. You have to wait it out. This is the important part. I can't stress to you enough how important it is to stay in the environment that is making you anxious and just being there until you become bored of the environment, right? This is the desensitization process. Becoming bored of the situation, the more you expose yourself to what makes you uncomfortable. So, Gloria, I want you to use that video 
and the strategies I've mentioned today and take that with you when you go and face your dragon. The next question comes from Leanne. She says, what are the top foods to avoid to help with mental clarity and reduce anxiety? A big part of our diet is causing inflammation, especially the the diet nowadays. A lot of the foods now in the grocery stores are pumped full of flour, sugar, vegetable oils. It's causing a lot of inflammation. It's causing a lot of depression. It's causing a lot of anxiety. You're not your body is not getting the nutrients it needs when you are eating junk foods like McDonald's or crackers, cookies, cakes, pies. And I notice even going to Costco, they have ready-made foods there. If you read the ingredients, it's full of crap. It's full of crap your body does not need. And think about it this way. If you're feeding your body a lot of foreign ingredients that haven't evolved with us throughout our evolution, the body is going to go, I don't know what to do with this ingredient. And so it it's like having something foreign within you and your body's like, I don't know what to do with it. And it's causing inflammation. It's causing a lot of diseases and autoimmune problems. So the first foods I recommend to you to not consume whatsoever, vegetable oils like grapeseed oil, sunflower oil, canola oil, palm oil, avoid those. I want you to avoid sugars, even organic cane sugar, demerara sugar, These are sugars that spike your insulin, that raises blood sugar, and cancer feeds off them. This is just not good for anybody. Okay, causes a lot of autoimmune problems, period. That's it. Next is uh, gluten, flour. Not good for anybody. Flour is no good. Even being on a ketogenic diet for me, I've noticed that almond flour for me just wasn't good. When I started to reduce the nuts I was ingesting, I was feeling better. And I found out later that almond flour has a lot of oxalates in it. And it can cause the kidney stones. It can cause some inflammation. It can, your body can have a negative reaction to it. And so going back to the first question by... Luke, I talked about cleaning up the mess of the house, right? And so the more you clean up the house, the more clarity you have over what foods work for you and what doesn't. So you start eliminating certain foods, you start to feel better. You start to see an improvement with your adrenal fatigue or your autoimmune problems and your energy levels increase, your mental clarity increases, and you go, oh, there's more to it than this. I'm so used to eating junk foods all the time. I never knew I could feel this way reducing these foods. And then I want you to add foods, more healthy foods that promote health, whole foods like meat, eggs, bacon, fish, some poultry. These are really healthy foods. And I want you to introduce vegetables too. And I want you you to experiment, like introduce avocados, introduce nuts into your diet, some berries, do that stuff. Like that's part of a ketogenic diet. And I highly recommend a ketogenic diet. I that's It seems self-evident now that this diet is the most beneficial for people because you're getting all of that healthy cholesterol, you're getting all those healthy fats from the meat, from the eggs, from the cheeses, from the that uh, saturated fat. Really, really good for you because all of our cells in our body are made out of cholesterol and fats. Our brain is mostly fat, right? And I noticed that when I introduce a lot of omega-6 
I introduce a lot of saturated fat found in fatty meat, my brain function is like on on a superpower. Like it's it's just powering so much more effectively. And so I want you guys to experiment. But Leanne, start with those things. Eliminate sugars, okay? Even for me, the artificial sweeteners are just not good for me. For 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 me, like they just don't work, um, because I still get bloated when I eat like stevia or xylitol, those kinds of uh, Splenda, stevia. I they're they're not they're not good for me. Um, but I want you to reduce the sugar. I want you to reduce the flour, all flour, and then I want you to get rid of those vegetable oils I mentioned. Start off with those. Michael asks a great question about being assertive. He says, how can I, who is shy, who is agreeable, become more assertive? Now, Michael, you might not see it from my videos or podcasts or or meeting me when we have a session together, but I was very shy. I was very agreeable. And I, well, I would, I would just be a people pleaser. That's who I was. And when I was improving on myself, when I was becoming more disciplined, I noticed that I was becoming more assertive. So when I was, when I was working on my social anxiety, I noticed that this was a skill I needed to develop. And I talked about this on a previous recent episode entitled Social Anxiety. And I talked about how I would show up at a Starbucks and I would talk to the barista behind the counter and it wouldn't go the way I would like it to go. I felt embarrassed because I would stutter. I wouldn't look her in the eye and all of these things. And I I, I walked out of there saying, man, I really blew that she probably thinks I'm this weak, shy person. Man, how can I ever come back here? But then I thought, wait a minute. That's exactly what I need to do. I need to come back here. I need to do this again. I need to try again. Because if I avoid coming back here, then I'm just going to be weaker. We see this in Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. Like He would meet with Rita, his coworker. And he would have a conversation with her and he would mess up. He would say something that offended Rita. And then Phil would go, okay, don't say that next time. You should say this next time. And since he's reliving the same day over and over and over again, he comes back and he sits down with Rita the next day. And he he doesn't say the thing that made her offended before and he improves on his conversation skills 1%. And he keeps doing this over time. He does it 10 times, okay, probably more. And by the 10th time, he's way better at having a conversation with Rita because he's just taking notes every time. Okay, don't say this. I should probably say this. This seems to work, so I'll continue to say this. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say this next time. I should add, I should ask this question instead of that question. And so he's constantly analyzing himself. And that's really important for self-development. And so to reflect back on the house metaphor about cleaning up your house, the more clean and spacious the house, the more clear your values become. Okay, let me just repeat that. The more clean and spacious the house, so the mind, the more clear your values become. You know then that not speaking up, maybe something tells you that you should say something or defend yourself, but you don't speak up, and you know That not speaking up, it only makes you weaker. And that speaking up and saying no, it fits with what's 
of important to you, what, what you value. You have clear values because of the disciplines you implement. What you constantly attend to the most determines what you value. So, for example, it's a simple no when someone offers me a cigarette. Right? I'm, a, I'm still agreeable. Yeah. But I'm way more assertive. I know where my lines are because I came from someone who smoked a cigarette, right? I I know that that's just not of what, like I'd rather sacrifice the, the fitting in with serving my higher health, right? I, I'm not, I, I value my tight relationship. So when I'm with somebody who, who, who I'm not close with and they say, have a cigarette, I'm not, I'm not eager to be a friend to them. Does that make sense? I'm not eager because I have my friends. I know what I value. If, if this person doesn't accept me because I say no to his offer, then he's not worth being in my life because I only want to be around people who accept me for what I value and who only want me to grow and be better than I was. That's really important to me. I want people to support my higher self rather than bring me down a notch on the scale. So for me to get to that point, I had to be really disciplined. I became a very disciplined person when I went through my anxiety recovery. The more I was confronting things that were challenging to me, the more braver I become. And that bravery bled into all other aspects of my life. So I became braver at telling people no, that's not what I value. And you just have to, you have to accept that. And that's that. No means no. And also I developed an inner trust within myself going through my anxiety recovery. I trust that I know, I know what I must do to maintain a healthy lifestyle mentally and physically. I know I have a trust in myself that I can accomplish what I need to accomplish because I've done so much already. I trust in myself. So that trust has been built up, has been stacked over the years of recovery to the point where when somebody gives me a difficult decision or asks something of me, I trust in myself that I can make the right decision. Because I'm thinking more clear than I used to when I was suffering from anxiety. I'm just in a better state. I don't have a lot of space. I don't have a lot of baggage anymore. I already got rid of that baggage. So I have a lot of space in my life to to analyze whatever comes into, into my existence. A difficult decision to make, I have more space around it. Or I trust more in my inner voice to to have more trust in my inner voice to guide me guide me in the right direction and i hope that answers your question michael because you know being assertive is something that is well practiced and it, it's well learned you have to work on yourself first right you have to expose yourself to difficult situations uncomfortable situations social anxiety is improved by practice and being more assertive is improved by practice and also what you do behind the scenes with you with you and your old self the battle between you and yourself that's where i'm going to leave you guys on today's podcast episode thank you again for these great questions Join the community on YouTube if you haven't already. I post videos there weekly, meditations. I post the podcast there. 
as well. And lastly, rise above anxiety. I will see you on the next video or podcast. Bye for now. Brad's Powerful Anxiety Recovery Program is now available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project Program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. Visit unpluganxiety.com 